is from Bristol, Virginia, a graduate of Virginia High School. She is a biology major. Um, she became an aunt for the first time last week. So if you were wondering, why did seminar get postponed from last week into this week? Um, it's because of baby Gus, who's adorable. You can ask her later to see this picture. Um, Paxton uh, is interested in a variety of topics relating to human health, and she is currently working on a Ledford slash Burke proposal to study glucose metabolism effects in C. elegans this summer, but she has a really interesting story to tell us about uh, brain anatomy and how it relates to depression. So um, I'm going to turn the lights off, get back there, and then start. So welcome, Paxton. So I first of all, did everybody have time to write down the title? I know it's take, we have long titles. <laughs> Just want to make sure that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the use of neuroimaging in predicting the evolution of depression in patients and predicting our treatment responses. So why does this matter? According to the CDC here in America, as well as the World Health Organization, depression is the leading cause of disability as well as the leading cause of suicide. According to the CDC, as of 2018, 800,000 people successfully committed suicide. That's not taking into account any attempted suicides. The demographic of depression of affected patients are actually 15 to 29. So they're high school and college ages, which is us currently. So having an awareness of this silent, it's not very, it's not talked about disease is important. An overview of depression is, it affects all aspects of life. Um, it can affect your enjoyment in life, it affects your quality of life, doing things, um, how well you do, how well you do the activities that you do. To be diagnosed as depressed, you have to have symptoms for more than two weeks. And the symptoms can, are, can be severe, moderate, or mild. Two of the symptoms I have listed are lethargic um, or um, lethargic or um, tiredness, as well as a loss of interest. The two studies that I'm going to be talking about later are actually in major depressive disorder, which is one of uh, the disorders of depression. Treatments for depression are commonly medication and therapy. Once you've been diagnosed, these are going to be SSRIs, TCAs, SNRIs, and MAOIs. SSRIs are the most commonly given antidepressants. SSRI stands for a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It targets the main serotonin gene, which is abbreviated 5-HT, and it just increases the serotonin production in the brain. Um, struggling with medication when you're diagnosed with depression is that medication will change rapidly. You will, when you're put on medication, it takes four weeks for your medication to kick in. And once, once those four weeks, that month is up, you'll go back to the doctor. And if there's no significant improvement in your treatment, you'll be changed. And so it is time consuming and expensive. And side effects can be varying and um, incredibly difficult to handle in everyday life, such as nausea. So to be diagnosed with depression, you use medical testing, such as seeing a psychiatrist. You can also do a questionnaire or family history with your doctor. Or your doctor can give you a self-testing assessment. Two self-testing tests that will come up in my two studies is the Beck Depression Inventory, a BDI score on that top, and the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression on the bottom. These are both additive tests that you score yourself on. And so the lower your score is more normal or healthy in regards to your severity of depression. The reason that the, you can score scores are variant is because we all, uh, all experience depressive episodes. We're just having a down moment or a bad day. But in depression, those are more common and more severe than just your everyday. I have Dr. Picker go get a chemistry test the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Neuroimaging is helpful in understanding the physicality of depression and what, how it reacts to people. On my far, on the far side of the screen, we see a PET scan, which shows the increased activities of the brain and the between the normal or healthy patient and a depressed patient. 
This one over here that I'm pointing to, it's an MRI scan, which, are what we, we, which is what we will be looking at later in the studies. This one is mainly in the hippocampus, and as you can see in your healthy control and your depressed patient, your hippocampus is actually much smaller, so there are physical changes in the brain regions. So an overview of the brain that will be neat, that will help us understand the future, one of the future studies, is the three of four of the four lobes in your brain, your frontal, parietal, and temporal. And what they do is your frontal will, will help with emotional expression. As we know, depression is a mood disorder. And so having issues with our emotional expression goes hand in hand with mood disorder. Your parietal and temporal both are processing of sensory information, which you take in through your visual or auditory surroundings. Two significant regions in the brain is the parahippocampal cortex, which will be right here in your brain and your anterior cingulate cortex right here. Both of these are green. And your parahippocampal and your, which I'll, the anterior cingulate cortex, which I'll, I'll be abbreviating as ACC, are actually very close together. This is from the back of the brain, and this is from the side view. And your ACC would actually be right in this area if we were looking at the back of the brain to see the parahippocampal and the ACC. My hypothesis that I formed while, stu while, studying these, while studying this topic was that depression is a multifactorial <laughs> complex disorder and the use of your energy shows promise in how to identify physiological issues and treatment problems through the neural pathways between healthy and depressed brains. My first study is the baseline brain perfusion and brain structure in patients with major depressive disorder. This was done in 2015 and is the Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience. They obtained samples of both patients with MDD and controls. As we can see, the BDI and the H8 and the Hamilton score that we talked about earlier is a lot higher in the patients with, in, with major depressive disorder and the controls. With the patients, they excluded anyone who had a previous head injury with loss of trauma just to make sure that there's no correlation between the two, um, as well as any family history of neurological diseases or mental disorders in the controls to make sure that there is as limited variation and bias as possible between these. So for the neural pathway labeling, they use something called a CS CASL, which is continuous arterial spin labeling. And this was done by injecting magnetically labeled arterial blood, blood water to trace the regional changes in the cerebral blood flow. Now the arterial blood water that was magnetically labeled did go throughout the entire body. However, the only interest that we had was in our cerebral blood flow, which is in the brain. Oh, well. For the analysis, we would quantify the regional cerebral blood flow, or the RCBF, for every one milliliter for every 100 grams of tissue per minute. And for the images, they did a volume means and to reduce any the waves of pathways between two different points. Um, real quickly, the graph the, um, scale that we have is just going to indicate the larger areas that blood flow should occurred in. This was, these two images, they're hand in hand together, and these are the two areas that showed to have a greater blood flow in the cerebral, cerebral blood flow in the brain, and the temporal parietal and the right stradial. As, we men as I mentioned earlier, the temporal parietal regions deal with sensory information. And here we have a graph to cor with correlation that um, your BDI score increases, and so too it does the milliliters for whatever 100 milligrams of tissue per minute with a positive trend between the two. These were these dots are individuals, they're the patients individually, and we have 
There's a cluster right here around 49 milligrams and 40, 35 ish EDI score. In comparison, we see that the controls had a higher regional cervical blood flow in the perihippocampal and the ACC. So these, these two areas are smaller in depressed patients. And we see that with the graphs that correlate with the, these two scans, that there's a negative slope between the BDI and the Ham Hamilton score, that as the Hamilton score and BDI increased, the, mil the milliliters per milligrams decreased. In <coughs> relation with the cerebral blood flow, they also measured the gray volume, the gray matter volume in your brain, which is the, just the um, amount of neurons in an area. And so now instead the, the bar graph, instead of showing an increased area, is showing a decrease in that one area. And they found some areas in the temporal cor cortex and the frontal uh, gyrus <laughs> um, to have smaller gray matter volume. From study one, they concluded that the gray matter volume and the regional cervical blood flow had no, cor had no connection together that you could have in regards to the severity of depression. They did find significant findings in the area in the areas of the brain that we just mentioned earlier to be in patients, and that the gray matter did not have any um, significant impact on the brain at rest. So once you've been diagnosed with depression, you're usually prescribed antidepressants. And so understanding how someone's going to react on that medication and if the first medication will be a good indicator of predicting is important to understand. And this next study is going to be solely ma major depressive patients on antidepressant treatment and how they react to that treatment. It was published in 2014 by the eBiomedicine. This is their sample size. They started off with 1,302 patients, speak correctly. And all of these patients, when they did the baseline, they had to make sure that they were all antidepressant naive, meaning that they had not been on antidepressants whatsoever. And so, so they were excluded before determining the baseline. We have the test cohort and the validation cohort. They used the test cohort to set up a model of how people are going to react to antidepressants before using the validation to reinforce their model. The first two medications that we see are both SSRIs, the serotonin selective reuptake, reuptake inhibitor that we mentioned earlier. The use of two different ones is that this first one um, the FDA approves a smaller dose. However, the cetrolon right here, the FDA approves at a higher dose. So understanding why two different doses would work is important here. However, the, the, the laxatine is an SNRI, which is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which tar is targeting more than just the serotonin. Um, Analyze completers mean they had to be on, each cohort had to complete their assigned drug for eight weeks. And so once they were completely finished that eight week course, they were given a DTI, which is a diffusion tensor imaging, and a volumetric measurement. If they did not complete eight weeks, then they could not be included in the study. So as I said, they used the DTI analysis, which is a diffuser ten tensor imaging, to find connections in, re in regions of the brain. And they did a volumetric analysis to measure the size and area of the brain. They used the ROC, which is a receptor operating characteristic test, to find any type of links between the two. They did the ROC three times, once with the DTI, once with the volumetric, and then once with both the DTI and the volumetric together to see if there's any correlations between the two. So the testing 
cohort, we have a yes and a no group of people who say they responded to treatment. Um, the yes are going to be responders, and the no are going to be not, excuse me, not responders. So at baseline, they they use the Hamilton rating score for this test, and at baseline, each group, the testing cohort, showed to have a have major depression. After eight weeks, the people who said they responded to treatment, they fell under the seven. Of, a, of the normal scale of the, of the Hamilton rating. However, the no did not, and so they were classified as non-responders to the medication. The validation cohort supported it um, by the I apologize, but it seems like the change got cut off in this image. Um, the percentage change at the bottom got cut off. So these two go with the baseline and the week eight. I'm not real sure what happened to the percentage change. I apologize for that. But you can see that the validation cohort responds similarly to the testing cohort. And so they're able to determine that something correlated together. This is the DTI measurement decision tree that they found. <coughs> When the FA stands for a fractional anistrophy, and an anistrophy is simply the exhibited characteristics that could be seen. So in their first decision, they concluded that if you had a fractional anistrophy for the left cingulum cortex of the cingulum bundle to be greater than 0 0.63, then you would be tested again to see if you had a fractional anistrophy for the right superior frontal occipital fasciolum that was less than 0 0.45. If you had this variation, you would be tested once again to see if, the F if your fractional anistrophy was for the right superior longitudinal fasciolum met their, their criteria. When they did this and they tested, the test, did the test cohort, and then established with the validation cohort, they only found that this model produced about a 43% accuracy in determining non-responders to medication. They did the volumetric model decision tree next, and this one was done for the left medial frontal gyrus and the right angular gyrus. Once they established the testing cohort and then they did the model once again with the validation cohort, they were able to predict an 82 accuracy of who would respond to the treatments that they assigned. <coughs> the conclusion that was drawn from the second study was that being able to test for non-responders with an 82% accuracy was a pretty good accurate <laughs> measurement model for who would respond on medication that they, the three medications that were given. They also, they all, this test also looked at the gray matter volume to see if there was any correlation with the depression as well. And they found that reduced volume in your gray matter also was associated with the, likely, with the reduced likelihood to respond on antidepressants, which is the ADM, ADM antidepressant medication. From these two studies, I drew the conclusion that dysfunctional or repression in the neural synaptic pathways is shown to be a contributing factor to the depressive disorder, and that changes in the brain are evident in depressed people. Future studies that are of interest would be to see if there's any distinct marker of depressed patients that can be targeted um, or found to pre-diagnose the likelihood of developing depression, or being able to individualize diagnosis, because as we said earlier, being put on treatment has its own struggles for people, even such as repeat changing their medication repeatedly 
as well as the expense and time consumption that it takes to find a working medication for people on depression. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, in your first study, I'm thinking you certainly saw changes in different areas of the brain. Did they go? Did they interpret that at all to talk about the mechanisms of what were going on, or how the various drugs worked, or did they get beyond just no. sort of the, the they, test and response? We in the first study, we were not focusing on the mechanism or medication or any such as that. We were solely focused on the different sizes of the two to see if there is blood flow changes between what's considered a healthy control and the depressed patients. Well, then did they talk at all about what their uh, criteria were for choosing the various medications, uh, thinking of that they were going to use it and, and analyze it in this fashion? The first one didn't focus on treatment or medication whatsoever. The second one focused on treatment and medication. The only, the only requirement for treatment was that controls did not have any type of history for alcohol or drug abuse or be on any type of drug treatment and the, control, and the patients could not be on any type of alcohol or drug abuse as well. I meant more, not, not the patient, uh, but I meant more the substances that they were testing. Did they have a reason for choosing the ones that you could pick up on or discern for the ones they used? Are you talking about why they used the continuous arterial spin labeling? Yeah. Exactly. So that, they used the CASL because of the fact that it's more stable than the other neural pathway labeling and gives them more time to obtain the image as opposed to a quicker labeling and putting um, pick their patients at risk for stress. Because the MRIs are done at a resting state. There's no activity, no music, nothing sure. going on. Yes. I wasn't very clear about the measurement of the gray matter. That looks like a sort of a discolored spot. So how, how do they actually measure the density? Is it based on the color that refracts out of the, that area, or is there some, some better quantifying method that they use? The image was just to show that this area was a lower volume. The, the, um, the gray matter in study one was done volumetric-wise. Right. So they took a, it was done density, I guess you would consider the volumetric density. And so the areas that were determined to have a smaller volumetric or a smaller density as opposed to the other ones were found to be a s lower in, in the gray matter, in the neurons that were in that area. Right, but when you say found lower, does that mean that the, the, the color of the imaging is, is less dense, more dense? Do they base it on the intensity of the coloration? So how do they determine that it is actually lower or higher? I figure out how to put this into words. Um, MRI testing, it will, at a solid density, it sh shows as the gray that we saw. And so at the, the lower the density, it is um, no coloration, smaller and lower shades of gray until you get no de definition. So when they found that there was gaps in the MRI, they determined that those areas were to have smaller, lower amounts of gray matter. But then they were able to correlate that with a plot, right? So when they plot something that actually has some, some quantity, some numbers, numerical scores to the density. So they, the gray matter was not plotted. <coughs> so what is the what is the graph that, that follows? That was the that was the cerebral blood flow. Okay, that's a blood flow graph. Yes. That was not the graph. 